Okay, it looks like we're going to get started. Perfect timing. So uh, the next panel, 3D printing, lots of conversation and discussion here all along the lines of what we've been talking about today. So to uh, lead this panel for you is Tony Hoffman of PCMag.com. Hi, and welcome to the 3D printing for the rest of us panel. And we have a great group of panelists. Uh, Duan Scott, uh, design evangelist for Shapeways and at Bits to Adam, Adams. Uh, Joey Neal, vice president of digital products for MakerBot. Charlene Flick, uh, founder of the New York City 3D printing entrepreneur meetup, as well as Transcend 3D. And Keith Ozar, who's director of consumer marketing at 3D Systems. 3D printing has come a long way in a in a short time. I test uh, 3D, or I test printers for a, a living, and up to a couple of years ago, the printer aisle in our labs was the, about the last place that people on lab tours tended to, to visit. And now people will go out of their way to, uh, to drop by, so there's clearly a tremendous amount of excitement, and not just on uh, uh, business uh, people, but uh, consumers as well as well as a lot, some wariness and uh, uh, misunderstandings. I, I've gotten several emails lately in which people have uh, uh, said, well, maybe we shouldn't be covering uh, consumer 3D printers because they're going to take jobs away from people. One email went so far as to say that we and everyone else should boycott all coverage of them. But at the same token, I don't actually, I'm not aware of anyone I know who actually owns a 3D printer other than people who build them. So there is a ways to go in uh, gaining con uh, uh, consumer acceptance. And there's uh, several potential obstacles. Uh, one is price. One is ease of use. Another is print quality. And there's also a consumer factor in... Uh, people thinking, well, what can I really do with it? Yeah, it prints Yoda heads and uh, all sorts of other fun things, but is this really something that I can need or use? So I'm going to now ask the uh, panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And also, uh, while you're doing so, uh, pretend for a minute that you're trying to convince a consumer to buy a 3D printer or uh, uh, or a uh, take part, uh, use a 3D printing service. And what 3D printable object or objects would you point out in uh, trying to uh, convince them uh, that this is something that, uh, that they really want or need? So, Duan? Hello, Mine's dead. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hey, my name is Duan Scott. I'm with Shapeways. And we're not trying to sell you a 3D printer because we're a 3D printing service. So instead of um, investing in a machine and a material, you just send a design to us, we print it and send you that object. Or you can buy an existing design online. And we print in over 48 materials at the moment. We start at plastics, we go through to stainless steel, ceramics, silver, brass, bronze, gold, and then the last one we launched was um, fancy, what's it called? Yeah, what was the last one we launched? We looked Platinum, platinum, we just launched today. So it's not just plastic parts, it's real finished products. So I guess as far as my personal experience, I've got my sunglasses are 3D printed, nylon. Um, my parts for my kid's stroller I replaced with stainless steel. The, the ring I gave my girlfriend is printed in sterling silver. So, you know, they're functional everyday objects that will last for a long, long time. Um, and so I guess that's the starting point for us is that those materials are now, it's not a consumer product in a printer, it's consumer output in the materials and things they make. Hi, uh, so I'm Joey Neal, VP of Digital Products. I oversee a team um, building and visualizing our um, 3D ecosystem. Um, so we announced a number of products at CES, a Replicator Mini, which is our first consumer targeted machine. Uh, and what I would say is you could take a look at some of the, the prints here. We've got uh, a really amazing digital store for digital content, sort of like iTunes. 
Um, we've got partnerships with Ugly Doll, Sesame Street. Um, all of our printers are Wi-Fi enabled, um, which really enables us to uh, quickly um, iterate uh, for the consumer. So we've got an iPad application uh, coming out later this week um, to allow you to uh, quickly customize um, type typography, rings, um, but more and more we're, we've got ease of use because um, you can basically use our applications and with one touch uh, send, a, send a print without having to prepare it, um, taking a little bit of the guesswork around, um, you know, you've said, hey, when it first started, it was just, you know, in the back, there was, it was just so hard, there was so much to it. Um, we really, really have worked on the, you know, making things seamless. Um, so we're really just getting started um, and um, really excited about our platform. Um, we've got also some mobile applications uh, for your smartphone. You can monitor your prints and have a little bit of a one-to-one -one relationship with the product. But the biggest thing is we're working on um, the capabilities for folks to really feel empowered, um, to get really great prints, and then to be inspired, and for folks to be in innovative and um, really get their feet wet and ultimately you know, drive them for the next, next leaders of um, innovation. Thank you, Charlene. Is this on? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlene Flick. I'm an intellectual property and technology attorney who's decided not to practice any longer but to launch a consultancy called Transcend 3D that strategizes with large enterprises and small enterprises on how to integrate 3D printing seamlessly into their business model. So it's a brand new consultancy, Transcend 3D, and it's exciting. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing how that develops. The other um, enterprise I've launched, as Tony has noted, is the 3D Printing Entrepreneurs Meetup here in New York City. Totally by accident, on a whim, <laughs> um, I have just became uh, intrigued with 3D printing. And I thought, New York is a wonderful ecosystem, a wonderful crucible. It has the manufacturing history. It has the design strengths. And I'd love to see who would come. <laughs> And, and I have to tell you, it's been quite an amazing trip. I mean, I have members that are going to change the world, so I would encourage you all to participate in that if you happen to be in the New York area. Uh, as far as convincing someone to buy a 3D printer, I, I think it all depends on um, what moment in time you are convincing them to buy a 3D printer. Uh, just this past year, I've seen incredible changes, incredible developments in this, in this area. Obviously, the industrial side has been around for a while, almost 30 years, but the consumer side is still nascent. And you have gentlemen like, like these um, working in very cutting-edge companies that are creating new things every day. So I would say if you want to be along for the ride, I, I think Steve Jobs um, tried to convince people to buy it, uh, a technology that was a combination of a typewriter and a television. <laughs> and that was a hard sell at its time as well. So um, to, to be in on the ground floor and to experiment and to see what you can do with it, that's how I would convince people. Um, hi, my name is Keith Ozar. I'm Director of Marketing Consumer Products for 3D Systems. Uh, 3D Systems invented 3D printing 30 years ago. So a lot of people think that uh, 3D printing is a new technology, uh, but it's a new technology that's 30 years in the making. And um, pe people are saying, well, what do I need 3D printing for? Why would I have my home? 3D printing is already touching your lives. Probably the jewelry you wear on your fingers, the shoes you wear on your feet have been gone through some sort of process for 3D printing when they were manufactured. Automotive, aerospace, um, uh, medical applications, they've all been happening for 30 years, but now these applications are, the ideas are happening in your home. So um, prosthetics for children are really expensive. We see those popping up on home 3D printers now for, for, for um, you know, just for a few bucks you can actually print a, print a hand for a child. I mean, that's really empowering. It's about changing the world. This is a tool that empowers people. Um, it's a it's more than a factory in your house. It's, it's, um, it's a tool that, for creation. So um, my company is developing a lifestyle, trying to sell, sell you not a 3D printing. 3D printing is just plumbing. Uh, you know, it's just like you don't, you don't sit there and watch your, your, your copier machine print things out. We, we want to get to the point where you just grab things, um, things print easily. So we want something, a machine that prints easy. You have an idea. You can go from idea to print in just a, a couple of steps, kind of like Instagram. CAD, you know, it's, it's really hard to learn for a lot of people. So um, the future of 3D printing, I guess, that how you get in your home is to create applications that, that you're accustomed to, like on your iPad, on your smartphone that's easy to print, prints that have been validated, um, co-creating with brands. We work with brands like the NBA, Star Trek, where you can 
create customized characters, figurines, which I think that's just the beginning, right? Um, it's not about toys, it's about useful objects and practical things, but just like the beginning of the computer industry, people started um, playing video games, they, that first big application was spreadsheets, and so they started getting into business uh, mode, and now we, all, we wouldn't think of a world without computers. It's gonna be the same thing about 3D printing. So, um, maybe 3D printing right now is a, a little bit more than the people in this room. It's about the next generation, about people who grew up with these uh, machines. It's about, you know, the child who grew up with a computer sees a computer a totally different way. This is a part of their lifestyle and who they are. So um, if you put a computer in your home, it's almost like a video camera you find in the closet as a child and you, you know, become the next Steven Spielberg. We're going to create industrial designers, engineers, architects, because they think in 3D. The world, everything you see, the way th doorknobs turn, the way you, you press buttons on an elevator, the way things are designed are going to change because these 3D printers are in homes. So it's about empowering the next generation. It's about empowering yourself to create and come up with new ideas, and it's a freedom. So um, if you can't see that, it's more than a toy. It's, it's about empowerment. Thank you, Keith. Um, I've been hearing the term uh, 3D printing uh, ecosystems a lot lately. You talked about it, Joey. Would you say more about exactly what the components of a, an ecosystem are? Sure, sure. So uh, we've got our printers. They are um, network enabled. Um, but where, where are you going to find inspirational content um, to really drive your innovation? Um, so we've got um, MakerBot Desktop, which contains um, MakerBot Thingiverse, um, which is our one of the largest communities uh, for 3D printing um, around. And we've, we've got a really vibrant community. We have design challenges. Uh, folks contribute hundreds of designs every single day. Um, it's always a, a wonderful thing to take a look at and, and see how folks are pushing things. Uh, beyond that, we've got our digital store. Uh, and we also have um, worked on uh, components for workflow. So we've got a cloud storage library, which allows you to save all the stuff that you found in Thingiverse, all the stuff that you purchased from the digital store, all of your own designs that you've, you've prepared. Uh, and you have access to those uh, through all our uh, suite of apps. Um, so ultimately, um, having access to all those and, and making it really, really simple and easy for the user. Um, our MakerBot Replicator Mini only has one button on it, and it's literally just find something, print it, press the button, and uh, you can watch it come alive. Thank you. Uh, Duan, um, what are some of the most popular objects uh, that uh, people uh, uh, are uh, ordering? Okay, what's really interesting about Shapeways is we get like over 120,000 different designs uploaded every month. That's a lot of different designs. And so we see popularity in a product go through waves. Because we don't mass produce, we have no inventory, everything's made on demand. When something's popular, we see a spike of that. So at the moment, there's a lot of parts for drones. So we see like drone landing gear, drone GoPro camera mounts, drone ashtrays, who knows. People can make anything they want. So once one person starts making amazing drone parts, we see the community start to get engaged as well. Then we'll see a community of drone parts just suddenly emerge and become incredibly popular on our site, and we'll print thousands of these parts. Um, at the moment, the most popular thing is we're doing a project with Google called Made With Code, and it's um, in, to help empower women, young girls, to learn how to code. And so they're, we've got this app that they're going into. They're modifying this bracelet, making this secret message bracelet, and we're printing like hundreds of thousands of these at the, at the moment. So that's the biggest one right now. We also see different waves coming through in materials. So once we introduced silver, sterling silver, we saw loads of jewelry come through. When we introduced full color printing, like so you can print an object in full color, uh, we saw lots of characters and figurines and avatars from films and games start to come through. So it all depends on what materials are available and then what community starts to engage in 3D printing. Thank you. Uh I had something to add, which is, um, you know, we built out this uh, broader ecosystem. We're also building out our developer network. Last week, we announced a developer program um, with an application called Modio. Uh, so it is a little bit of a toy creator, but it is a, an innovative uh, ability to customize uh, elements of a toy. And uh, 
What's really interesting about that is that's driving another level of new economy, you know, just like the App Store uh, did. Uh, developers who have creative skills or 3D skills uh, can develop really innovative experiences uh, that then can be able to be printed, printed out through our products easily and seamlessly. Yeah, that's really important because who in this room can 3D model? Boop, one person. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so the rest of you, that's a barrier to entry. So you cannot print something unless you buy a static object or customize it with an app. And so similarly, like Shapeways has an API. So developers can create their own applications which generate 3D models and you can make something, you can customize a product. And we've seen when somebody has some sort of um, participation in a product. So whether it's a, a jewelry app where you're customizing it, putting uh, some initials in there or changing the form slightly, you have a different level of ownership on that product than you do from a, a mass produced item. And so what we see as the major way for people to access 3D printing is through these apps, like you mentioned. And these app developers can make a decent income because of the API, the way it works is um, they make some software. Each time the model is uploaded and bought through Shapeways, Shapeways takes care of the transaction, takes money off the buyer, sends the object to the buyer, and then the developer gets the cash each time it sells. So it's a way for a developer to get a passive income to monetize an app really, really easily. Tony, I did want to say something about the ecosystem, if I may, sure, just to follow sure. up. Um, I think an ecosystem like the one uh, that's being built currently is vital for the success of this technology. I think it's vital for a, the success of a lot of um, groundbreaking technologies throughout time. Um, essentially, you're talking about the delicate dance between content and conduit once again, between technology and content. Uh, to give an example, when you think about the early days of television, Television was around in the 1940s. No one wanted to buy it. <laughs> it was a clunky, expensive machine. Then Milton Berle came around in the United States, and I'm not dating myself. I wasn't around at the time. <laughs> this is not a primary source, but I understand that the streets of New York were quiet on a Sunday night or something to that effect. Um, and people wanted to buy televisions because there was something on TV. And I think that um, as these marketplaces evolve, as people find uses within their home, as people send out to service providers as well for more intricate, complex objects, I think that, um, that the ecosystem is really going to be um, the focus of a lot of... Um, of a lot of hope for this technology going forward. Yeah, and we need to be an internet age ecosystem, not a walled garden of television. We want it to be open so anyone can participate, can run their own business based on these platforms and can make things happen. We don't want control, we want openness. Yeah, uh, but I also believe um, the ecosystem needs to be a curated ecosystem. I mean, prints that can be validated, a consumer wants something that's easy. So we need to, to make things that are printable. We need, a, we need to curate applications that, are, that actually work. Um, and people, are, fashion will never go away. Trends will never go away. People want to co-create with brands and licenses. And so we, part of our job is also is to, to bring onboard brands to, to join this ecosystem so they are along with the ride. Um, we're not going to do it with just uh, you know, these, these small trending brands. We have to do it with some of these big brands. So I see that in the future as a big part of this uh, introduction to consumers and the ecosystem is um, something that's easy. You wrap your head around, it prints, and it, it's something that you already uh, lived with for the past you know, 100 years. The other part that I would say on the ecosystem is, you know, especially for us having, um, you know, our first real consumer printer is having uh, a really great support mechanism, having, you know, that, that's part of it, like everything within it. Um, the materials, um, being able to, to call somebody and, uh, you know, get some help to get things through. But ultimately, we're driving towards that, that experience that's, that's seamless. Um, but the machines are mechanical, and you know, from time to time, there, there are things that are going to have to be, that are going to be new for a user at first, but once they get through it, then they're, you know, they're good. Thank you. To switch gears for a moment, uh, since the topic of brands and licenses came up, uh, Charlene, could you say a little bit about what you think the uh, going forward as consumer 3D printing takes hold? Uh, the uh, uh, key intellectual property issues or struggles that we're likely to see? Sure. Um, what to say about intellectual property? Goodness, it's a bit of a landmine. Uh, but again, nothing new when you come um, to terms with the disruptive technology. In fact, if any of you are interested, there's a, a paper um, I authored for 3D Printing Magazine called um, Copyright and 3D Printing, Everything Old is New Again. And um, again, I'm using historical reference here, but uh, we're talking about, um, I remember in law school, a case about the player piano role and how that was going to be the end of copyright as we knew it. It was going, um, 
the gramophone, for instance. Um, John Philip Sousa talked about uh, this is going to infringe on his rights and how could this technology take away his hard work and investment. So this is not a new type of confrontation we're dealing with. Um, if you think about 3D printing, I, I like to think about it in terms of two camps. You have the industrial side, right? And there, I don't see as many intellectual property problems because you have a centralized place. A lot of these industrial products are so complex, you can't really counterfeit them or you don't want to counterfeit them. Um, you have mechanisms in place like nanotechnology for authentication. Um, there are controls in place. It's the consumer side where it's going to be a bit of the Wild West, okay? But not unlike Napster. So uh, I guess um, as a consumer, you have to be very aware that some of these networks are hosting infringing items, um, that rights holders have to pursue their rights, that artists who want to create and want to do it in an open source way, that's wonderful. But be prepared for people potentially um, using your works for purposes that you didn't envision. Uh, I know of artists who have told me that they've taken their, their works off of some of these 3D printing networks because they've seen them commoditized um, by other people. And, and even ones that um, under a Creative Commons license uh, tried to get attribution for their work, that's all, that's all they wanted, they didn't want money, they didn't get that. So, um, so what happens in an, in an environment like that is that the really good designers go into a hole and they don't want to share what they've created. At least that's my perspective, I, I've seen it happen. And so, um, so I think there has to be, um, you have your IP rights, that's not going to change, but how you want to exploit them? Do you want to give them away for marketing purposes, such as Nokia did or Ford did, in order to drive um, revenue to your other products? Or do you want to actually make a living off of your works and sell them? These are considerations you have to make as um, someone who both consumes others' 3D printed items and, and people that want to create their own. Thanks. I think we have to understand that digital content cannot be contained. Like, it doesn't work. The music industry tried it. The, the movies tried it, the game industry tried it, doesn't work. So let's not have that retarded battle again. Um, if you're going to put something out there, it's out there, accept it. If you don't want it out there, don't put it out there. There are ways to share information and design without releasing your 3D files. Once you've released your 3D files, it's out there. Let's just let it go. The other thing is copyright and patents and trademarks are very, very, very long terms of time in the time of internet, like things move fast. By the time a patent has expired in technology now, it's, it's so far beyond useful. Like it's a barrier to innovation, it's a barrier to improvement. And the reason why 3D printing has moved so slowly for so long is it's been locked down with patents. And it's only with the, with the, with the um, expiration of the FDM patent, as we saw MakerBot, the RepRaps, the Ultimakers, all these 3 printers hitting the market. So we need things to move, things to move faster. So maybe we should relook at trademarks, copyright, patents, to see how we can, you know, make things innovate, make things happen. Yeah, I would say, you know, in, in all the things that happen on Thingiverse, um, the community really will p police it. Uh, you know, it's, it's not in our realm to, to, um, to just really be informed by the users. And you would think that it would be, things would be a lot more rampant, even with scanners and other technologies that are coming out. But it, but it's very very low impact. I mean, um, and and the community really speaks out uh, volumes. Um, and you know, DMC takedowns, et cetera, are, are very 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 few and far between at this stage. At this stage. <laughs> yeah, but I think as a company, you have a responsibility to protect your consumer, see what's coming through your networks, because. Um, you know, and you also, you know, if you if you want to bring brands and make them comfortable, you have to make sure that um, that there isn't content up there that that um, that infringes on other people's rights. Um, if you can recognize it, if there's a complaint, you have the responsibility to take it down immediately. Um, but it, it is early stages. Um, it, you know, if you could see it, you could touch it, you can hear it. It's it's probably be, you're able to copy it, but. Um, the value with brands, I mean, do you want to wear a real Rolex or do you want to wear a fake Rolex, you know? So when brands start coming into this space and you have content that's validated, it works really well, prints really well, it has, um, you know, your licenses uh, fit that, that brand to the T, you know, you, you're getting that, that athlete's face on there, you're going to want that content and it has a little bit more value. So that's how I, you know, right now it's, it's everybody's making, uh, you know, their own version of something. But um, as brands come on, you're going to want that, the real thing. I mean, I really feel that. And, and I should add, there is one trademark, um, 
it's not a case because it was settled, but if you recall last year, there was a gentleman that tried to create an iPhone dock, um, iPhone dock that was out of the Game of Thrones throne, right? I don't, I don't watch the show, it's, I should, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so he created this and people were excited about it. He, he was gonna sell it on the network and HBO sent him a cease and desist order and said, this is our intellectual property, it's pretty clear cut. Well, I think it was more than that. I, I think HBO liked it. But from what I heard, someone already paid for a license to create um, the, the, co the content. So someone's already paying for this so they can make uh, Game of Thrones cell phone. You know, you're, you're paying for this, you're, and then all of a sudden someone comes along and you're stealing your market. Why, do I, why, do I, why would I pay for that? Right, but, but in effect, even if there was no competitive force there, it's still a violation of their intellectual property. It's still derivative work coming from their, from their intellectual property. So, so they're within their rights from my perspective of saying, hey, can you take it down? Or maybe negotiating with that yeah, gentleman. Yeah, the smart thing to do is to say, that's cool, our fans like it, just give us a cut, it's fine, make that. Which could include... We, we saw it happen with, um, it's a weird thing, the internet meme of Success Kid. Um, I don't know if you guys know it, Success Kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they know. So some... <laughs> inane internet meme that people will put sort of um, messages on the, page, on the bottom of this photograph of this kid with a sandcastle behind him with his fist. And so someone in our community 3D modelled Success Kid and put it for sale. It went really popular on Reddit and he was selling loads and loads of them. And then Success Kid's mum would go, that's awesome, I'd like one. And she goes, hang on, you're selling them. You're making money from my son's likeness? Then she goes, I want a cut. And so now they go 50-50 in the revenue of the sale of Success Kid. And now Success Kid is successful for being success kid. Yeah, and uh, it's Ryan Kittleson who designed that, and he does all these memes that, that come up online, but yeah, he was willing to like, you know, he recognized that, that he has a responsibility to pay, um, you know, the creator of the content, which was the mother who created the child, <laughs> which is, is, which is uh, pretty awesome. But um, yeah, it's developing an industry that didn't exist before. And, uh, it's, it's You'll see more and more creative licensing um, arrangements, and I think that that's, that's gonna stretch the creativity of the lawyers as well, but I think that that's, a uh, win-win situation in a lot of ways. Yeah, the lawyers need to realize that the creators of that content, which violates their IP, also own that version of the IP. So they can't try and you know, steal that away from the creators. It's gen user-generated content, even if it's violating some IP. It's like a, a song with a sample in it. It's still that person's song. So I was just going to say, you know, we created the digital store in order to have these brands be a little bit more comfortable about a little bit of control of where that content's available um, and in the way it's delivered. Uh, so starting with Sesame Street, now with Ugly Dolls, and, you know, ultimately uh, it's a start and everyone knows it's, it's sort of the future and they're getting their feet wet now. I mean, I would love to see the content and the conduit, the technology and the content producers work together. And in fact, that's one of the theme of, of that article I cited is because I've represented both technology companies on the cutting edge and incredible content um, companies. And historically, they've fought quite a lot. <laughs> and yet they're symbiotic. They need each other. So I'm hoping history doesn't repeat itself. I'm hoping we don't have that another type yeah, of The thing is, of the like hundreds of thousands of objects we get uploaded every month, there's like maybe three things which are based on someone else's content. The rest of it's all innovative new designs which do not but don't, don't exist before. And it's because you can make these small niches happen is it's really powerful. And you're also selling um, content that's manufactured and shipping. You're not, you're not selling a file. So when a file goes out to a space, it goes out, that's to one person, it could go out to everyone. So that's where brands are scared. But, um, but there's ways to protect that IP so you can't just um, you know, model over it or change the face on it or, you know, that's what people are afraid of. Is there of. though? Is there? <laughs> I don't know, let's see. I think there is. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could model from scratch, right? You, so you could take could a file and modify it, and no one knows it's where it's based. There's no way to protect a file. No way. Like a, like a STL file. Once it's out there, it's out yeah, there. Yeah, but you have a responsibility to protect it the best you can when you put it out there. But if Computer somebody downloads software it from is the protectable. Site, it's Computer software is protectable. And if you're talking about um, the files that are actually the origin of all these 3D printed items, right, there's going to be a bit of debate. You know, if it's a utilitarian object. Well, that's not copyrightable. For so anything. the STL file is the, the open source file that, that 3D Systems created, the Chuck Hole created in the beginning. That's the standard for everybody to, mo to model with, the, the 3D print. That you can edit. But then there's companies that have you know, their own content that can be printed that's their, their um, file extension that can only print, be printed on their machines. So um, I, I guess there's always a way to, to switch that around, but we have a responsibility to try to protect that IP and uh, the best we can. Um, yeah, because people own that content. There's no way around it. 
the 3D printed object, uh, the 3D printers that we've seen that have been aimed at a consumer level have been uh, plastic, fused filament fabrication. Uh, you mentioned stainless steel, but what in terms of consumer household printers, uh, Keith, are we likely to see in other materials? Yeah, so we just launched, a, we have actually a couple of materials. So ABS and PLA for the past few years, ABS was the start. Everybody was printing with the same, you know, we call Lego material. Everybody calls the ABS, same stuff Legos are made out of. Then PLA got really popular. It's a biodegradable um, corn polymer. Um, uh, over the past couple of years. Now the next generation of machines, um, uh, we have a machine uh, that's going to be printing in nylon, um, which is really strong material. We also have, uh, I'm really excited, it's called the EcoCycle. Um, our, our chief creative officer, uh, Will I Am, came up, he has a company called EcoCycle, where he takes, uh, he, it's uh, about um, thinking responsibility, uh, responsibly. Um, we created this, this machine that can print an RPT, so it's recyclable Coke bottles. Um, EcoCycle is a partnership with Will I Am and Coca Cola. We partnered with them, and made this machine that can print in recyclable material. So, um, so new materials are what I'm really thrilled about. Now, in the maker community, we've been trying to push everything from from tr like peanut butter and frosting, jelly, anything we can put put through these machines. We you know uh, we did. So, uh, in the maker community, they're already printing in uh, conductive material. They're printing in uh, in in um, material that's um, uh, they're, print, they're printing in bronze material I've seen, um, uh, ceramic material that comes through these extrusion machines, but they're highly experimental and they, they don't, I, I just wouldn't run it on my machine without, you know, they're, they're for makers and people who want to experiment and not, a, when, where the hobby is the machine. The maker isn't about just making things, it's about fixing things. So you want to run anything through your machine, really push it, they're the trendsetters. So um, they have no problem with print, printing with these materials, but uh, yeah, so there's there's some really nice materials that are that are uh, on the horizon that just from these tastemakers that are there that are pr producing stuff. Yeah, um, there's also some cool wood materials. Same on the maker side. Um, yeah, I think for for now uh, on the consumer side, PLA is really the most reliable thing right now for for consumers. Uh, there's a lot of research going on for other materials uh, that will. You know, we'll have to sort of wait and see. But the really cool thing, you know, users uh, using our products, uh, really doing um, some, you know, once they get up to the level of wanting to do some rapid prototyping, uh, they can then go and uh, execute over in Shapeways and get metal or some of the other materials. But they can really prototype at the level at the home or the office. Yeah, so like, I, I see that. So it, at the home machine, it's really, it's, you can consider it a drafting tool. You can have this machine on your desktop for, for $1,000 that you can produce something and you're like, okay, it looks really good. Then you can send it off to a service bureau. We have one called Quick Parts. There's Shapeways, there's other service bureau. And there's, there's hundreds of materials that you can print in. Um, what I'm really excited, we're coming out with a machine that prints in edibles, uh, sugar. So um, in the next year, you're gonna have, for, there's a machine that's under $5,000 called the Chef Jet that it's gonna change the bakery industry. You know, I always joke that, uh, you know, it, the bar mitzvah industry, the wedding industry, it's gonna explode from this, but the 99 cent stores, going out of business. This is, this is what uh, 3D printing offers, you know, like edibles, uh, full color um, edibles that, that, I mean, I can scan you and make you into a cake topper and you're edible. And, uh, and I guess we're looking forward to multiple materials. So now each printer prints one material at a time, be it plastic, stainless steel, silver, brass, bronze, ceramic, anything, but we can't currently do like plastic and metal at the same time. So that's what we're sort of looking forward to in the future electronics, multi-material, because like everything in our lives is more than one material. Like mm -hmm. this microphone's got so much stuff in it. We actually have a machine, the, the 5500X, that produces in plastic and rubber, so you can mix that together. Yeah. So we made a hammer, and we made a, a, a ping pong paddle. I mean, it's amazing, it comes out and you're like, you know, we, we, uh, we were at um, a store downtown called iMaker last week, and we actually pulled out, were you there for this? And we pulled out that, we had to hang something on the wall, and we were like, let's, let's try the 3D printed hammer, and it went right up on the wall. It was, it was awesome. It was like yeah. the that's, future. That's <laughs> variations of acrylic resin, though. It's not two materials. It's a slightly different composites of those materials. We need, like, real different materials. Yeah, and we have uh, flexible material, too. I mean, there's a lot of folks who are really prototyping, like you said, shoes and, uh, you know, really interesting wearables. 
I, I think flip flops, 3D printed flip flops. Yeah, that could change a third world country real easy, where you can't ship goods and then there's uh, you know kids running around barefoot. It's like yeah, soft materials. Let's print some flip flops for people. And that can change the way we manufacture. So we can have supply chain production distribution all in the U.S. or localized. More importantly, so the way we work is like nodes of production. So instead of having one factory in China, where you send a design from the U.S. to get it tooled up, get it, the prototype sent back go back into production, send it to the US, distribute from here around the world. Like there's a lot of carbon footprint. Instead, we print locally. So we have, you know, if you order it in Germany, we print in Eindhoven. If you order it in Canada, we print in New York. And that's what we see one of the great values of 3D printing is agile on demand, 3D printing localized. Yeah, I should add that um, as someone who's not as steeped in the technology on a daily basis, you all work with the machines and you work in these companies that are producing some of these materials. Uh, when I first got into 3D printing, my dream was to create my own dinnerware set. I want to design and print my own dinnerware. And I was in for a rude awakening, obviously, right? I wanted to do it out of porcelain or ceramic, and um, I couldn't just press a button and do that at home. I could do it with plastic, but it would be toxic, right? Um, I don't think it's food safe necessarily, some plastic. So that wouldn't be a good option. Um, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to have to make the dinnerware. I love to design, so that's not a problem, but I can't work the design software. So, <laughs> so these are real obstacles that consumers are going to face. And I think that people, um, I'd love to see more companies get involved in the input aspect of it, of making the actual modeling for those that want to model um, easier. But I should tell you, in a, in a society where, yes, there are creative people, there are makers, but there are a lot of people that want to read a sound bite or a Twitter feed or something and just want to hit a button. So it'll be interesting to see how much is really going to be people's own creations and how much is going to be downloadable files that people tweak to customize and that's about it. And I'd love to hear everyone else's perspective on that. Yeah, we have a, we have a simple app which is basically a virtual potter's wheel. So you can go on there and like drag three points with your mouse and print a plate. So you just got to go to the right side. Yeah, it's like, do you listen to music or do you make music? You know, I can um, turn on GarageBand and start making some music. I don't know if everybody else wants to listen to it, but but there are tools out there that make things easy, and uh, and that that's exactly what we're trying to offer are these these simple app solutions. Just like everybody, ha nobody's a photographer, but now that you have Instagram, you can press next, 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 and you have a beautiful picture with a filter, and like, look, it's it's art, you know, and. Uh, that's that's what's going to happen, and then you know throwing throwing a brand, uh, getting a brand to curate the the actual um, bricks that you can drag and drop, and you know type in your name and it appears on there. I mean, what 3D printing really offers is um, personalization, customized, one of a kind things. I mean, that's what's great about it is uh, what I have doesn't have to look like like exactly like yours, and um, and it's still the same cost across the board, whether we produce a thousand things that are unique or you know a thousand things that are exactly the same. So the customability, customization, uniqueness, that's what's really special about 3D printing. So how do we create the software that that brings you into that experience with your brands? Because it sort of drives you into that. That's creating something beautiful. You know, it's like uh, you know, it's like a Lego set. You know, some people are really good at it, but you, you usually can make something cool. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, that's what we're trying to do with Print Shop is um, we've got Bracelet Maker, we've got uh, Ring Maker, we've got um, some extrusion tools. It's sort of just getting started, um, but gives them the user to, to feel like they've got some power, um, and ultimately they'll, they'll be driving to innovate further, and they'll, they'll go to a Tinkercad or they'll go um, be inspired by Thingiverse to kind of push things forward. Um, but, you know, and then there's the digital store when you sort of want to lean back and just like, oh, I really want that great thing that's, you know, someone spent a good amount of time designing. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues. Yeah, and also, like, even beyond, uh, you know, just designing on screen, scanning in the past year has just opened the door. We released uh, the iSense yesterday. So iSense is a scanner that attaches to your iPad, and basically you walk around a person. I, I call it physical photography. Um, you know, it's about scanning people and things and everything that you normally take with your you know your cell phone picture that you can you can scan and view on screen and share as a digital model on screen but you can also easily go through just like an Instagram next 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 and it's 3d pr 3d printable in a matter of minutes um, so I've been doing this for a while. Yeah, you know, I scanned my wife when she was pregnant. I did more scans when after my son was born. And my desk doesn't look like a traditional like you know you have the picture of your wife on your desk. I have all these figurines of all my friends. Um, I, uh, so so you know you go to the mall and you, you get you put your kids on Santa's lap. I hired a Santa this year, and this store in the East Village called Cubo. We had a Santa come in, 
and we, we did Santa Claus. We had kids scanned on Santa Claus' lap. So thinking about things that you normally do with a camera, it's a whole new way to wrap your head around what 3D printing is. It's, it's, it's going to revolutionize. Like, how do we introduce this to the consumer? It's, it's introducing it in a way they already understand. So it, that was a lot of fun. So my, my son's first Santa photo, I have my desk, but it's an actual 3D uh, print. And I print it in full color. I mean, uh, you know, we offer cloud services that you can upload and get it back in full color. It's, 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 it's awesome. Uh, I send one to my, to, to my mother. My, you know, the grandmother gets this thing. It's, 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 yeah, she's showing to everybody. So, um, you know, once you get a MakerBot or a 3D printer, you start looking at the world a little bit differently. You start questioning, hey, can I, can I design that? Um, it really, there's something that goes, goes off in your mind um, once you start using it. And same with the scanning. Um, we've got a digi uh, MakerBot digitizer, and you start going to people's houses and start looking on their shelves because you're wanting to replicate <laughs> almost everything that they have. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. And not to be the, the negative point here, but the scanner and intellectual property, just think about it, people. <laughs> Okay. For, pers for it's personal photograph. use, it's a photograph. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's physical photography. It's 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 not the exact thing. It will never be that, but it's a representation of that that time, the moment, that space where you were. You know, I you know I was in Italy and I saw the statue and I I have this this totem from my trip and then I have it on my mantelpiece. I'm like, I remember that time. And you, you I, I've done hackathons at the Met. You know, I walk through with teenagers and we scan artwork and they allow us to do this. We scan artwork and we make other artwork out of that. The second they print it out and they hold it in their hand, they know the story, the backstory. It's like they're a part of this artwork because you have to walk around the art. You just don't take a picture and walk on. You get to know this, this object. It's, it really, like you said, it opens your eyes to the world in a different way. It's like, how are things made? Can I make that? If I'm going to make it, can I make it better? Can I, I'm, if I'm going to, if I break a dimmer switch, do I want to run to Home Depot? Do I want to print it out? Do I want to put my wife's face on that dimmer switch? I mean, you're, what material will I print it in? It opens up this whole idea that it doesn't have to be what everybody else has. It can be for me. And it's, that's, that's empowering. Thanks. We're running a little low on time. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Nike, uh, business applications, when you go from about 16 to 22 pieces down to two or three pieces. That's the thing. With 3D printing, complexity is free. So it's traditional manufacturing. The more detail you put in there, the more expensive it is to tool up. With 3D printing, often the opposite is, the, is the, the true. So you pay for how much material you use. So they can make a custom shoe, clog, cleat, whatever it's called, exactly to fit a single person each time. And it costs no more than if they're all mass printed exactly the same. So it can save labor time. We have parts that have, we have designs that have 122 moving pieces, which come straight to the machine with no assembly. So. Yeah, I mean, having the machines there within the business itself uh, just allows them to iterate very, very quickly. Um, then to go, f you know, from that 22 down to six, to fail, to just quickly, you know, make some modifications. Uh, and then before going out for tooling or whatever, whatever the manufacturing process is, it's just, it just really, really t tightens the time scales. And, and you think about that in a sneaker, think about it in an airplane part, think about it in a fuselage or, or an engine. I think GE is very active in that space and, and it really, you know, what is it they say about 3D printing that complexity is free, what so. Job job We're hiring a lot of people. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we manufacture here in Brooklyn. Uh, we are, are, I don't know if we have, do we have public numbers out there? But we have, we've created hundreds of jobs in the area. Uh, we're still growing. Um, it's just, things are, things are, things are booming. Yeah, I hired all my interns that graduated this year. So, yeah, there's jobs. And, uh, it moves to America. Is the Nike factory moves to America because production, the cost of machine running in China versus the cost of machine running in the US is negligible. There will be shifts in the workforce, no doubt, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be a negative impact um, as a whole on the economy. Yeah. Um, the printing press was disruptive, and I'm sure people lost jobs as a result. We saw when desktop publishing came in that graphic designers were like, the sky is falling, I will not get any work anymore. But what happened was when people have access to these tools, they make the things they want, not necessarily 
finished products all the time. So that the graphic designers no longer make invites for their auntie's birthday party. They can get some clip art on Word and make their own invites, and the professional designers make professional things, and it'll continue to happen. Those yeah, make better things. I agree, and I think product, just like um, things trend on the internet, products will trend, objects will trend, and people will want them, and uh, there's always, people have to create these things, you know, so there's going to be... Uh, and there's huge educational efforts as well, training the next generation of workers. And in some ways, there's more mobility and more security in, in, in some of these technologies because you can create a 3D model that's transferable and you can live anywhere and do it. And, and what's interesting about this technology, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the day when the internet was first you know, getting some traction, you had to be in Silicon Valley. Everyone I talked to was like, oh, we're moving to Silicon Valley. Um, that's not the case um, with this technology. You know, in, in, um, in Amsterdam and in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, you have a strong design community. Here in New York, we have a strong design community. Yes, out in California, they're doing it. But you know, my meetup group is linked in with the meetup group in Beijing, with the meetup group in Holland. I mean, it's just incredible. So there's no epicenter, really. We had another question. Last. So a little more practical question. Um, we lose a lot of the backs of remote controls and you know gaming console controllers at home. Um, are you guys being approached by or approaching manufacturers of you know hardware that already exists to see if they would give you the schematics that's, of, that's, of you know replacement parts? That's starting to happen really slow. Like <laughs> large companies are scared of their IP, even if it is a back of a remote control. Like it's it's stupid. But, the, but um, some people are starting to look at it. But the thing is, let's, let's look at the other way. What if you say, OK, I've got access to a 3D printer, be it desktop or in Shapeways. I can quickly model that part and make a replacement part myself. But then the, the opposite. Let's think back to your scanner. What if you have, if these guys are smart and they say, OK, we don't release STL files, but we want to make them available as printed parts. So you have your scanner. You scan the back of your remote control. It says, hey, is this a? X brand remote control, you say, yeah. Are you missing the battery case? You say, yeah. And I said, print, and it'll come to your door. And we print it by Shapeways, and they don't have any warehouse of, of battery case backs in Singapore waiting to be shipped out. Yeah, I think exactly exactly right. It doesn't have to come on a, you know, on a truck to, a, to, a, to um, on a boat to a warehouse where someone has to answer the phone on another truck to your house, it's like I email it to either your home you can print it or you can pick up locally where someone has a, has a machine that can print in uh, higher end materials. It's, it can be localized manufacturing. And also companies can use this as, as trends. So if a, a company makes stoves and they have s the stove knob, they put 100 different stove knobs up online and people can download and print it. When they produce that stove, they can see what people are downloading and they can sell the stove with the stove knob that's trending. So they can, they can actually use this as research tools. They can see where the market's trending how to sell their products better. Yeah, and we see people putting those replacement parts up on Shapeways already for, down, for, for printing. So the guy had a Volvo and it had no hook. Like, this is the most inane thing in the world. He got, had a Volvo with no hook for his, for his dry cleaning. And so he printed his own and fixed a problem that Volvo didn't fix, put it for sale on Shapeways, and then we sold hundreds of them because everybody else had the same problem he had. And he solved it, Volvo didn't. We've run out of time. I want to thank our panelists. It's been a very uh, engaging and uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sonia.